Okay, Shoshanim, an unusual opening, you must admit, with some vaknin. Every day is Halloween. But today, unfortunately, we have to discuss another nutcase, Norman Bates of Psycho fame. Psycho was a 1960 masterpiece by Alfred Hitchcock. For those of you who are too young to remember, who never watched this movie, rush to the entrances and go and watch it. And for those of you who have watched it, this video is going to contain quite a few spoilers, so you have my apology in advance. We are approaching Halloween and I received a comment from one of the more discerning YouTube viewers. Since we are approaching Halloween, she wrote, I thought it might be interesting to request a video of your analysis of this scary psychological thriller movie by Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho. I'm curious of your breakdown of the psychosis and how that relates to the narcissistic mother identification issue, as you've explained on your YouTube channel. Is this level of depravity just an under the surface with narcissists and psychopaths? Or is there a lower level of this type of psychopathy already going on with the narcissist in relation to the mothers? Okay, I'll do my best to meet this high bar, this level of expectations. First of all, let's be clear, like many other films by the inimitable Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho is a morality play. The hidden messages, bad things happen to bad people. The victim in, in the film, the woman who ultimately gets slaughtered, uh, is Marion. Marion is cynical. She is impulsive. She steals money. She changes her car midstream on the spur of the moment. Um, and at the drop of a hat, she veers into an isolated motel. She just acts on impulse. And her sister confirms that when she says to Marion's lover that patience is not a virtue of the family. Marion is delinquent, criminal actually. And yet she's capable of experiencing guilt. She feels guilty. The other protagonist is Norman Bates of the Bates Motel. Norman Bates runs the always empty motel. He's humorous, he's charming. He appears to be totally normal. He's very insightful and very helpful. A mask of sanity. Actually, at some point during the film, he provides Marion what, with what could easily pass as psychotherapy. He talks to her about life, other people, mistakes we make, decisions and choices that we regret and what we should do about them. At the end of this impromptu, improvised therapy session, Marion thanks him, her future killer. A mask of sanity, as Harvey Cleckley puts it. And yet, yet, immediately it's evident that something is wrong with Norman. We tend to gloss over such toxins we see, such warning signs. We tend to ignore them, suppress them, neglect them, overlook them, reframe them. We don't want to believe bad things about other people. We want to believe that the world essentially is good, that people essentially are helpful. And so when we come across any of these tintinabulations of evil, we simply look the other way. The first glitches, the first glitches in Norman's behavior are evident minutes after he has met Marion for the first time. For example, um, Norman is unable to say the words bathroom and falsity, false. He stammers when he lies to the detective 
when he's stressed, when he contemplates sex, he has a harsh inner critic, a superego that inhibits him, prevents him from talking, impedes his speech. And that's a very important sign. If we look at the content, at the content of the speech act that is intermittent, halting, stammering, we learn a lot about the person. If someone is unable to point to the bathroom and use the word bathroom, it's because bathroom is about nakedness. It's about the ultimate privacy and intimacy. And these are issues that bother Norman a lot. Similarly, Norman cannot say the word, the word false or falsity because as far as he's concerned, lying is the ultimate sin. This is what his inner voice keeps telling him. That's what his super ego torments him about because Norman is living the life of a lie. All of Norman's, all the elements in Norman's life are lies. He lies about his mother. He lies, he lies about what he does to women. He lies about many things all the time. And consequently, Norman is tormented and tortured most of his waking hours by this internal voice, which, as we will see, he does not perceive as internal. He externalizes. We'll come to it in a minute. Norman says, I'm not a fool and I'm not capable of being fooled, not even by a woman. He has a very low view of women. He is essentially a misogynist, although he would never admit to such a thing. He hates women because he fears women. He's afraid of women. Women, starting with his mother, have power over him. They are able to transmogrify him, to fool him, to cheat him, to cause him inordinate pain. And so women represent the potential for hurt and he hates them and he loathes them and he shies away from them. Never mind how mightily he is attracted to some specimen of this subspecies, to women. And then he adds, as a kind of afterthought, she might have fooled me, but she didn't fool my mother. Norman's mother is his false self. Norman's mother is perfect. She is omniscient. She is impeccably, impeccably morally upright. She is everything that Norman is not. Norman is spineless. She is strong. Norman is indecisive. She is opinionated. Norman is soft-spoken. She is harshly critical. Norman is imperfect. She is perfect. Norman can be fooled. He is stupid. She can't be fooled. She is omniscient. She is godlike in her amazing intellect and intelligence. So she is, of course, a false self in the clinical sense of the word. In the first exchange between Norman and his mother, that Marion overhears, Norman's mother sounds like a jealous lover. She implies that eroticism, not to mention sex, are bad things. And she humiliates Norman. Tell her that, she says, or do you have the guts, boy? She constantly demeans and debases and shames Norman. Even this brief, briefest of brief exchanges is enough for Marion to form the opinion that Norman should not remain silent, that he should react, they should, he should somehow put a stop to it, and maybe even walk away altogether. Norman hesitates to interact with Marion in any intimate settings because he is very, very attracted to her. It's not very clear why he is attracted to her. Marion has a lot in common with Norman's mother. 
she is opinionated, she is cynical, she is harshly critical, she is observant, she is shrewd, she is street smart, smart, she is cunning, she is a kind of maternal figure, a replica, if you wish, of Norman's real mother, and intimacy with her, with her. Sex, for example, would be highly incestuous. So Norman is very loath, reluctant to, for example, enter Marion's cabin where she's staying. He invites her to have dinner, a sandwich actually, in his parlor, the anteroom of his office. The parlor is full of stuffed birds mounted on the wall. Death, signs of death are everywhere. He tells Marion that taxidermy, stuffing animals, is his hobby, but he likes to stuff birds because they are passive and compliant and submissive. Uh, Norman associates pleasure with submissiveness. He associates comfort with death. He stuffs birds because he can't tolerate life. He wants to convert life into a mounted exposition, totally controllable, inert, immobile, and it is at his beck and call with perfect access. No one rejects life in his hobbies, but also in his daily routine. He hides in the office. He maintains a motel which is dead because the highway has been, has been moved over. There's no traffic and the motel is always empty. All 12 cabins are always empty. He says, we have a vacancy. We have 12 vacancies. Everything is empty. Empty exactly as Norman's core is emptied. The motel is a reflection and an extension and in a way an emblem of Norman. The motel represents Norman. It is empty. It is vacated exactly as Norman is empty and vacated. There's nobody there and it's dead. There's no life in it. There are no visitors. There are no guests in it. No one doesn't even bother to ask people to sign the guest book. And so the motel is Norman. Norman keeps his mother, who he claims is an invalid, he keeps her in the house. House is separate from the motel. The motel is his kingdom. The motel is where he becomes. The motel is where he feels that he could be himself. And the way, the way to become himself, time and again, is to kill. To kill women, to kill birds, and to stuff them. Also the women, but we'll come to it a bit later. When Marion asks him if he has friends, Norman's automatic response is, I'm thinking responses, a boy's best friend is his mother. And he exposes an immaturity coupled with an exceedingly powerful, omnipotent introject of his mother inside himself. He says, I give up on the rest of humanity because I have mother. And mother is all I need. She is my best friend. Norman says, we are all in our private traps, clamped in these traps, and none of, us, none of us can ever get out. We scratch and claw, but only at the air, only at each other, and for all of it, we never budge an inch. Marion answers, sometimes we deliberately step into those traps, and Norman retorts, I was born in my trap. I was born in mine. I don't mind it anymore. Marion is a bit taken aback. But you should. You should mind it. 
And Norman says, a bit mis mischievously, Oh, I do mind it, but I say that I don't. Sometimes when mother talks to me like that, I feel I like to go up there and curse her and leave her forever, or at least not light the fire. But I know I can't. She is ill. And of course, this is projection. It is Norman who is ill. We don't know enough about his mother at this stage. Everything we, we've heard of her, we've heard from Norman. But as the film unfolds, it becomes clear that the sick individual is actually Norman and he's projecting his sickness onto his mother. And you haven't heard the half of it. <laughs> Norman says, Norman proceeds, a son is a poor substitute for a lover. If I were to leave her, the fire will go out. It will be cold and damp like a grave. If you love someone, you don't do that to them, even if you hate them. And then he catches himself. This rare admission that he loves and hates his mother. This ambivalence. And he says, I don't hate her. I hate what she has become. I hate the illness. As we discover, ironically, later in the film, it is Norman who made her what she has become. So his hatred of the current transformation of his mother is actually self-hatred. Because everything has, has, his mother has become was wrought and created by Norman. Every single bit, every element, as we will see later. Whatever his mother has been transformed into, she has been transformed into by Norman. It was Norman's doing. So this is the ultimate expression of self-loathing, self-hatred, and self-rejection. Norman is hating himself, rejecting himself, loathing himself through his mother. His mother is this introject, this internal object, this voice inside his mind that keeps telling him, you're a bad object, you're evil, you're a liar, you're spineless, you're gutless, you are not very bright, you could be easily fooled, you should avoid women, you're stupid, and so on and so forth. These constant emanations and communications from the bad object coalesce in his mind into a mother picture, a mother figure. To be a mother means to demean and debase and shame and humiliate her son. The son, never mind how, how much he wants it, can never be a lover. In other words, the son can never be loved by the mother. The mother's role in Norman's life is to maintain the integrity and the power of the bad object inside Norman's mind as a way to control Norman, of course, for his own good. Norman hates himself and rejects himself and loathes himself through this mother introject, augmenting, empowering, and magnifying the bad object with every sentence and with every action, because a good boy does his mother's bidding. A good boy does not disagree with mother, does not challenge mother, does not invalidate mother's judgment. A good boy modifies alters his behavior so as to prove mother right, to vindicate her and to validate her. When Marion suggests to put the mother somewhere, elsewhere, Norman becomes aggressive. He stiffens in a threatening way. And he says, you mean an institution? A madhouse? What do you know about caring? Have you ever seen the inside of one of those places? The laughing and the tears and the cruel eyes studying you? And of course, he's describing his own nightmare, not his mother's. He's afraid of ending up in a madhouse. He continues, my mother there? And then he becomes 
ominously aggressive, almost violent. His body language is pretty threatening and invasive. My mother there, she's harmless. Just one of those stuffed birds. She needs me. It is not as if she's a maniac, a raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? And this is a therapeutic moment, therapeutic moment for Marion. She suddenly is able to see herself through Norman's eyes, which is the first very important step in therapy. The ability to uh, mirror the patient so that the patient can gain insight. Ironically and crazily, insanely, um, Norman, the madman, becomes Marion's therapist and succeed to induce an awakening, a healing in her. And she says, she, she kind of snaps out of her reverie. She stole a lot of money and she's on the run, on the land, sometimes pursued by the police. And she says, he asked her, we all go mad sometimes, haven't you? And she says, yes, sometimes just one time could be enough. Thank you. And at that moment, she decides to go back to Phoenix to return the money and to turn herself in. It was Norman. Norman who cured her, healed her, brought her to, his, to her senses and restored her morality and her reality testing with his madness. Very, very crucial and amazing insight elaborated on by the likes of Michel Foucault and Althusser, but we'll not go into it. I won't torture you the way Norman is torturing Marion later in the movie. Time for wine break. And yes, you keep wondering if it is why. This is Halloween, what can I say? As I've said, because of the harsh internal interject, what we would have called earlier in the history of psychology, the superego, the sadistic superego, or the harsh inner critic, because of these voices that keep tormenting him, Norman is very attuned and very sensitive to lying. He's hypervigilant. He's sure that everyone is trying to fool him. This his mother told him that he's stupid, that he's gullible. So he's constantly on the hunt for clues and proofs and evidence that people are lying to him. Marion lied to him about her name and then foolishly forgot the name that she has used and the lie was exposed. She signed the guest book using another name. And Norman smiles to himself. It's a kind of triumph, a victory. He exposed her for the liar that she is. At that moment, of course, she deserved to be punished. The inner voice in his head, the mother interject, is very punitive. It is self-punitive in the sense that the mother interject seeks to punish Norman for who he is, for what he is, not only for his misbehavior, but for his constitution, for his composition. So the mother interject also seeks to punish others external to Norman, people who may threaten Norman, people who may fool Norman, people who may seduce Norman, people who may tempt Norman, people who may lead Norman astray, people who may take advantage of Norman. The mother, in other words, is a protector. Now, at the end of a movie, there's a caricature of a psychiatrist who kind of analyzes Norman's psychology. And I beg to differ with most of the things he says. <laughs> I actually disagree with many of them. He says, for example, that the mother 
is romantically jealous of Norman, that there was an incestuous relationship between them and the way he was jealous, romantically jealous of his mother and her lover, he projected this jealousy and he assumed that his mother is jealous of him. So the psychiatrist's thesis is Norman was jealous when he saw his mother with another man and he Norman projected this onto his mother and he assumed that his mother would be jealous if she were to see him with a woman. This is only a part of the picture. I think a bigger part is the protective or overprotective nature of the mother. She is there to defend Norman because he is defenseless and helpless. It's a form of internalized learned helplessness. The minute Norman caught Marion lying to him, she became a potential seductress, a manipulator, an enemy, because lying is instrumental. Lies are weaponized very often. Norman doesn't have any idea what Marion might want, but she definitely doesn't mean well. At that point, she becomes an enemy, and the protector state, which is the mother, essentially a kind of violent psychopath, the protector state is triggered. And remember that in my work, there are self-states, especially in people with mental health issues, personality disorders, there are self-states, and one of the self-states is always the protector, protects the other self-states. So, in this protector self-states, is usually a psychopath. So we have this, for example, in DID, dissociative identity disorder. We have it in borderline personality disorder. We have it in narcissistic personality disorder. We have it in psychopathy, classic psychopathy, and so on. Same with Norman. He has a protector state. And Marion has triggered this protector state. But at the same time, he finds Marion sexually irresistible. He is a voyeur. He peeps through a hole in the wall, in the partition separating his office from Marion's cabin, and he sees her undressing and naked. The minute he does, his sex is sexually aroused, and he rushes to his mother, because this creates in him an enormous conflict. And the conflict is twofold. He is cheating on his mother, with another woman, and his sexual arousal renders him fallible, vulnerable, in danger. He perceives sex or sexual attraction as ominous, a threat, and he rushes to mummy for protection, and also to make clear to her that he is not about to cheat on her. His loyalty lies with her. She is the only woman in his life. And then, of course, we have the iconic shower scene. We see the blood circling the drain. It's a purge, a purging of evil thoughts. It is a symbolic scene. Norman is genuinely shocked by the murder. But the murder was the only way for him to get rid of the temptation by purging the evil that has invaded his mind via the sexual vector, and also to restore the harmony with his ever-observant, ever-present mother. Norman seems quite skilled at removing all traces to the crime, the murder of Marion, body included. He carries the body from the room, to the trunk of, of, of his car, the way a bridegroom carries his bride over the threshold after a wedding. Very interesting. He enacts life amidst carnage. He's very gentle with the body. He doesn't, doesn't just dump it or drag it or whatever. And so there is a kind of symbolic wedding which involves death rather than life. 
in crossing the threshold of the motel, which, as you remember, is Norman writ large. The motel is Norman magnified. Crossing the threshold of the cabin, leaving the motel behind, is actually taking his bride to face the world. Which world is this? The world of death, because this is Norman's only world. The birds are stuffed, and as we shall discover soon, his mother is long dead. The mother that he communicates with daily, interacts with, argues with, listens to, adheres to, is intimate with, she doesn't exist. She has died 10 years ago, 10 years before. Norman, Norman's world is inverted. It is death that brings life, and life threatens death. One by one, society begins to encroach on his erstwhile isolated and protected world. There's Abrogast, the detective, Sam Loomis, Marion's boyfriend, and Marion's sister. He kills Abrogast, but he doesn't stop more people from coming. He feels besieged. His interaction with Sam Loomis, for example, is very already very disrupted. He's unable to function. He's unable to talk coherently. He's falling apart. He's disintegrating. He's sliding into a psychotic state. At the time the film was made, in the, in the 60s, multiple personality disorder was a very big, big thing. It caught the imagination and attention, not only of professionals and scholars, but even more so of the media and mass media, show business and so on. So, at the end of the film, there's this psychiatrist that I've disdainful, disdainfully mentioned before, and he diagnoses uh, Norman with multiple personality disorder, two personalities, Norman and his mother sharing the same body. That is, of course... <laughs> expressly untrue. In multiple personality disorder, which was later named dissociative identity disorder, the person, the sub-personalities do not communicate. The alters, they're called alters, the alters do not communicate with each other. The mother alter and the Norman alter would never talk to each other, would never know about each other's existence. There is a host, which is a mediator between all the other broken fragments of the personality. The alters, the sub-personalities, the pseudo-identities. So, as someone with multiple personality disorder, you would have a host personality, and you would have a mother personality, a Norman personality, and perhaps a few other personalities. And they, they wouldn't know about each other, except through the agency of the host. But Norman is not the same. In Norman's case, the mother and Norman not only know about each other, but they co cohabit, they coexist, they talk to each other, they argue with each other, they shout at each other, <laughs> they touch each other. They, so this, the, the extent of the interaction is such that this is most definitely not multiple personality disorder. Under threat, Norman assumes his mother's personality, replete with, a, with an ugly, cheap wig and a dress and a knife. But he never, he never loses sight of the existence of his mother. He, there is 100% communication between his mother and himself and Norman, these two, these two sub-personalities that occupy his mind and his body. It is true that when Norman murders young women, he dissociates and the mother personality takes over completely. That is true. And so the diagnosis that fits Norman nowadays would be OSDD. And I have a video on this channel which deals with borderline personality disorder as a form of OSDD where I explain OSDD in detail. Norman has what I call 
embedded introject. Let me explain to you what is an embedded introject. Do you know when you talk, for example, if you were to talk to a good friend about your abuser, you're in an abusive relationship, your intimate partner or supposedly intimate partner is abusing you egregiously and you're really broken and damaged and so on and you go, you talk to your friend, to your good friend. You know, sometimes you assume the identity of the abuser. You imitate his speech. Your body language becomes that of the abuser because you want to demonstrate to your good friend how your abuser talks, what your abuser looks like, and how, how, what is the language of his body. So for a minute or for, for 10 seconds, you become your abuser. And this is the embedded introject. It's when the internal voice, the introject, the internal object inside your head, which represents your abuser out there externally in reality, you have a representation of your abuser in your mind. When this representation takes over you, compels you to talk and walk and act as if you were your abuser. And this happens more often than you know. How many times did you catch yourself acting like your mother? Saying things which actually were said by your father. Arguing with a husband that's no longer there. But in a way that you emulate or imitate both parties. How many times did it happen to you? It happens to everyone. And this is an embedded introject. It's an introject that hijacks the body introject that takes over the body and embodies itself. An introject that is reified through the body. And this is what happens to Norman in his OSDD condition, which is not psychosis. Norman's condition is clinically not psychosis. It's a form of dissociative identity disorder, which has nothing to do with psychosis. Norman doesn't have any problem differentiating between external objects and internal objects. Norman doesn't see hallucinations. There's no psychosis there. There's just a situation where the introject inside his mind is so exceedingly powerful that it takes over time and again, especially in order to protect Norman. And then the introject embed, embodies itself, forces Norman to use his body to enact the introject, to wear a wig, to wear a dress, to, to become his mother. Of course, his mother is actually mummified. He stole the body of his mother 10 years before and he stuffed her. She stuffed like the birds. And why did he do that? Again, my interpretation is different to the interpretation of the alleged or so-called psychiatrist in the movie. I think he did that because he needs to be seen. He, uh, Norman, Norman's core identity is a derivative of his mother seeing him. His mother's gaze defines him and gives him, provides him with boundaries and with a sense of innate, constellated, integrated self. Actually, Norman's self is outsourced. His mother became his self. His mother became an introject so dominant that he displaced all other internal objects and took over the entire inner space as a kind of Lebensau. <coughs> you see why I drink wine? If it is wine, of course. It's Halloween. Don't forget. So Norman needs to be seen. When his mother died, there was no one to see him anymore. Literally, by the way, he's a total schizoid hermit. He lives 100% alone. So he stole her body because he wanted to keep her alive in the sense that he wanted to keep, he wanted to keep, he wanted her to keep seeing him. That's why he places her embalmed, stuffed body on a chair facing the window overlooking him in the motel. That way he is always seen by his mother. He 
needs to be seen and it's not enough to imagine her in his head seeing him he needs the physical complement he needs the physical body seeing him through her long dead eyes the empty sockets that's how powerful the interject is interject forces norman to use bodies human bodies his body his mother's body the girl's bodies he needs to embody the interject because the interject is too overpowering too all pervasive too too big geographically speaking for his mind the interject exits his mind because it takes over the entire environment and so every body that happens to be around is at the disposal of the interject and is used by the interject that way with a stuffed body of his mother sitting on a chair and facing the window Norman feels seen by his mother all the time and of course this means she can intervene and protect him when the need arises but what really has happened what has really happened we said that Norman's mother died how did she die Norman is young when her, when his mother found a lover Norman Norman felt jealous betrayed and not seen anymore in his mind Norman was merged and fused with his mother also sexually in his mind he and his mother were in an incestuous relationship especially possibly emotional only but in an incestuous relationship not necessarily only sexually but emotionally they were one they were a single unit and suddenly this unit broke apart and his mother found another man Norman is a man so it's as if his mother started to see another man not him and he and Norman became unseen invisible so he was not only jealous romantically as the psychiatrist in the movie is suggesting but he was all if, in my view he also felt betrayed and he also felt annulled non-existent his mother is not seeing him anymore so he doesn't exist to restore his existence he needed to kill his mother's lover but also to prevent this from happening again this betrayal he needed to kill his mother as well he needed to immobilize her he needed to render her a stuffed bird passive and easy as he characterizes his stuffed birds and Norman spreads the lie which by the way proves that he is not psychotic he is very he is very much attuned to his environment he knows what's happening he knows how to manipulate people he knows how to keep safe he spreads the lie that he found his mother and her lover dead in bed of strychnine poisoning everyone came to believe that his mother administered the poison having found that the guy she was with has lied to her about being married that's a story that that Norman succeeds to sell everyone on he's very good at manipulating he appears very reliable very responsible very truthful exceedingly charming and so on and so forth in short a bit of a psychopath but actually it was Norman who killed both of them and having killed his mother Norman failed to get rid of his guilt and of her introject the introject was provoking the guilt in the first place and the solution was okay I killed mommy I killed my mother her introject is inside my head so anyhow she's alive she's talking to me she's chastising me and castigating me and criticizing me and humiliating me and shaming me all the time she might as well be alive and I feel guilty that she's dead so let me revive her because I'm omnipotent I'm godlike Norman as you guess by now is actually not only OSDD but a narcissist caught in the vice of guilt egodystony shame and the constant raging battle with his mother's interject Norman hits upon the solution of 
simply reversing the process. If he feels guilty about killing her, he will unkill her. He will revive his mother. He will let her use his body and his mind, kind of introject possession instead of demon possession. So Norman comes up with two solutions to keep his mother alive or to resuscitate her, having killed her. One, he will abscond with her body and stuff it, and this way keep her alive for good. And he will allow her to use his body for locomotion. So here, he doesn't need to feel guilty anymore. He may have killed her once, but he has given her two bodies in return, hers and his. She shouldn't be angry at him. And he doesn't feel guilty, actually, in the movie. You don't see him guilty. He's arguing with her. He's disagreeing with her. Um, he, he kind of moves her around despite her protests, protestations, despite her, you know, she's very angry at him, but he moves her around, moves her to the cellar and back to the room as he wishes, as he pleases, because he feels that he has given her more than she had lost when he killed her. Now she has two bodies to use. Norman is a man and he murders seductive and attractive women in a misogynistic payback for what his mother did to men, to his father and to himself. And also in order to assuage his mother's supposed jealousy. So I agree with the psychiatrist at the end of the movie. It's a pity we are not able to meet. I agree with him at the end of the movie that Norman's imputed jealousy, when he imputes jealousy to his mother, Norman is actually projecting his own jealousy. He is jealous, romantically jealous, of his mother being with another man, and he assumes that she should be jealous of him being with another woman. That part is true. But there's another part. Norman hates women. Norman hates women because the only meaningful woman in his life has tortured and tormented, destroyed him, did not allow him to self-actualize and realize his potential and become everything that he could have become. A wonderful man is so handsome, he's so talented, he's so gifted, he's so charming, he's so everything, and his mother stunted his growth. His mother kept him dead, in effect, a plaything. And he resents her for this. He hates her for this. And she's a stand-in for all, all womankind, because she's the only woman who's ever been meaningfully integrated in his life. So he hates what his mother do, does and did to, women, to men, also his father. And what he does to women is payback. He killed his mother, but now he's going to kill all women because they misuse and abuse their sex. They're out to hurt men. They're out to humiliate and shame men and manipulate them and take them as fools. Women are evil. And he needs to exterminate any one of them that infests his territory. Norman conducts vociferous dialogues with his dead mother precisely about this issue, about women. But these dialogues are also about who controls who. Who is the ability to hurt whom now? An inversion of the power matrix. For example, his mother refuses to be to remain hidden in the cellar, in the basement, in order to not be found, as not to be found. The interject resists repression. Taking his mother's stuffed body and hiding it in the cellar is a perfect metaphor, a perfect <laughs> enactment of repressing the interject, of shutting off this maddening voice inside his head that won't let him be, definitely won't let him be in peace. And so it's very symbolic. He is burying his mother again. He took her out of the grave. He gave her an existence as a stuffed version of herself. Then he let her use his body and it's never, been, it's never enough. It's never been enough. She's been at him and at it 
relentlessly, ruthlessly, mercilessly. And he hates her for that. And he doesn't want other people to find her because he understands the implications as far as he's concerned. And so now is the time to protect himself and to bury his mother again. And she resists as any, any interject would. It's also a symbolic act. I'm going to bury you again and that way maybe shut you up inside my mind. And the bad object emerges at the end when the mother talks to herself at the police station. Of course, Norman transforms into his mother when he's arrested because the mother is a protector self state. She protects him against the police. But the mother also has a very clear view about who is responsible, who is evil, who is unworthy, who is stupid, who brought them into this predicament. The mother says, the mother embodiment, the introject embodiment, the introject actually says, he was always bad, talking about Norman. The mother says, Norman was always bad. I should have put him away years ago. In the end, he intended to tell them that I killed those girls and that, and that men, I killed those girls and that men, as if I could do anything but sit and stare like one of his stuffed birds. I will sit here, I'll be quiet, just in case they do suspect me. They're probably watching me, let them. They won't see, they don't see what kind of a person I am. I'm not even going to swat that fly. They will see and they will know and they will say why she wouldn't even harm a fly. At the very end of the film, possessed by the interject of his mother, Norman talks to himself in the capacity of his mother and reaffirms the bad object. You, Norman, are mentally ill. It's all your fault, Norman. You were stupid enough to bring us here. You are the one who killed the girls. So you are, you are evil. You're dangerous and malevolent. I, your mother, am blemishless. I'm innocent. I'm impeccable. I'm the reification of good. You're evil. I'm good. It's splitting, self-splitting defense. And I'm going to demonstrate to the world at large and to the police more specifically, how innocuous and harmless I am. And then they will realize who is the real culprit, the real criminal, someone who should have been put away many years ago. I pitied you, I loved you, so I didn't, but I should have. This is the interject's final revenge. This is the ultimate self-destruction. Turning Norman into the police. She is snitching on Norman, in effect, in a way. And this proves how much she hates him. Because clearly, Norman would be executed if he is not found totally insane.